here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. Two dominant investing themes over the past year have been artificial intelligence and weight loss drugs. And while there's a considerable investor frenzy around AI, particularly the Magnificent Seven and now the Fabulous Four, shares of two companies that dominate the weight loss drug market have also surged over the past year. And that's because of soaring demand for their products. Shares of Eli Lilly are up over 130% over the past year, and uh, those of Novo Nordisk are up over 65%. In today's episode, we are talking about weight loss ETFs and some other interesting ETFs. My guest today is Yuri Cordia Mirian, CIO of Tema ETFs. Tema offers the first weight loss and obesity focused ETF currently on the market. The ticker symbol is HARTS, H R T S. They also offer some very interesting other thematic ETFs. So we are going to talk about those ETFs. Yuri, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. So you're joining us for the first time on this show. So we'd like to know a little bit about you and also about Tema ETFs. Yeah, of course. So um, my name is Yuri. Um, I am the chief investment officer of Tema ETFs. Um, I uh, have a background in fund management. I've been doing it for well over a decade. Um, I started my life as a long short analyst um, on a global hedge fund and then got promoted to run a, a was quite a sizable fund um, focused on investing in global equities um, across different sectors, but with a little bit of a specialization in healthcare stocks. Um, and then very recently, I've joined Tema to be their CIO. I also run one of the strategies that we've got, one of the ETFs. And um, my focus really is to, to build out the investment team, the investment process, and make sure that we deliver great investment outcomes because all of our ETFs are actively managed. Very interesting. Now, let's talk about these weight loss drugs or GLP-1 medications. So these drugs like Ozempic, Vagovi, Monzaro, they, I understand, were initially developed to treat diabetes. And then later it was discovered that they also suppress appetite and lead to significant weight loss. And I also read about a recent study that suggested that GLP-1 drug drugs may also slow the progression of Parkinson's symptoms in human beings. So let's start with a primer, as many of us may not be familiar with how these drugs function. So please tell us what exactly are GLP-1 drugs and how do they work? Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating story. Um, it sort of starts back in the 1970s when these GLP-1s were first derived in a lab and discovered. And they've really been part of a quest um, to search for how the body effectively stimulates the production of insulin. As we all know, uh, in diabetes, uh, it's a really big problem in terms of production of insulin. And so we've been trying for many, many years to try to find a way to control insulin, either by injecting it or finding other ways for the body to produce it on its own. Uh, and really what happened is that we were testing these GLP-1s because uh, they have a very known effect on stimulating insulin production. And um, it, it had incredible effects really uh, for, for diabetics. But what they also found was that as a little bit of a side effect, these patients were starting to lose weight. And um, Novo Nordisk particularly started to investigate whether GLP-1 drugs have an effect on weight loss. And so what we have right now is this kind of interesting world where you have the drugs that were originally developed for diabetes, like Ozempic and Monjoro, which are effectively drugs that are only prescribed for diabetes. But their active ingredient has been turned into another set of drugs, Vigovi and Zepbound, which are approved in diabetes and weight loss. And it's it's really 
like a, a, a one of these stories where kind of unintended consequences, isn't it? Um, but the real challenge was trying to figure out how do you drug this target? Um, but biological and life science uh, drug developments is extremely complicated. And it's not enough to just figure out, okay, GLP-1s work and they, they work in terms of affecting insulin production, but they also work in terms of suppressing appetite and creating these weight loss effects. But how do we actually develop a drug that can target that particular molecule uh, or a molecule that can target that target within the body? And that was a real breakthrough that uh, Nova Nordisk and others made. Um, and the biggest part of it was getting them to be tolerable, which is a really, really important part, which is can we give it to patients and they can tolerate it, as in they can actually take the drug safely. And that was the breakthrough that's led to what we have today in terms of semaglutide, uh, which is the active ingredient within Ozempic and Vigovi. Very interesting. So as I mentioned earlier, shares of these companies uh, have surged over the past year because there's so much demand. So could you talk a little bit about the reasons for excitement and so much interest in these GLP-1 drugs? Absolutely. So, um, well, I think the biggest issue that's been going on is uh, obviously what we found in the early studies of weight loss is that these drugs were leading to sort of somewhere between 13 and 17 percent weight loss which was incredible as a result. Um, just to kind of give you perspective, the gold standard in, in weight loss, you know, if you're really overweight or obese, particularly obese, uh, you sometimes can get this thing called bariatric surgery. And there you see weight loss of often of 30%, but it's an extremely invasive uh, surgery and it's really only given to very severe cases of obesity. And you know, if we were getting 15% through a drug, this was a huge breakthrough because they're all the medicines that had come before that in obesity were sort of getting maybe 4 to 5% weight loss. And this set off the frenzy because really obesity is an enormous market. So there was a study published in Lancet this year by a group from Imperial that estimates that there are about a billion individuals globally that are obese. And obese is defined as having a BMI over 30. Um, and so a billion people is, is a huge number. 200 of, million of those are adolescents and children and 800 million adults. And so there's an enormous kind of market. And then the other part that's happening is, is that obesity itself is associated with about 200, in some estimates, 220 different what are called comorbidities or other diseases. The well-known ones are diabetes, but also we have cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, all kinds of problems. And what's happening is that we're running trials to show that these GLP-1 drugs are showing benefit in all of these types of different diseases associated with obesity. And this is really unlocking the medical potential because weight loss, is, it's, and metabolic effects are always very complicated, right? You lose the weight, but does it really have an effect on health? And we've done major studies now, including the, what was the biggest study uh, in cardiovascular outcomes done for semaglutide, which is called the SELECT study. And that showed in 17,000 patients over five years that you've seen uh, an improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. And that's really been the watershed moment. And from here on out, we're hopefully going to prove out more and more different diseases. And that's really causing the medical frenzy, if you will, in these particular um, um, obesity treatments. In terms of the stock market, people just look at that 1 billion number. They think you know, these drugs can fetch in the thousands of dollars a year. And you just, you don't have to be a genius to multiply the two together and figure out how big these markets could potentially be. These are definitely very exciting developments. And you alluded to the enormous size of the market. I read a recent forecast by Goldman Sachs, and they predicted that the market for these um, drugs could soar to $100 billion by 2030. And they expect uh, these two giants, Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, to dominate this market. They say that they are expected to control about 80% uh, of the obesity market by 2030. So I was interested in your thoughts on the current uh, market size and also future projections. And do you think this market will remain a duopoly? 
Oh, so there's, there's a lot to unpack there. I think in terms of market size, uh, we've consistently believed that the market is going to be a lot bigger than people forecast. Uh, if you look back just say 12 months ago, you know, we were hearing forecasts of sort of 30, 40, 50 billion. And now uh, Goldman Sachs come out with a 100 billion number. Morningstar is forecasting 150. So the numbers keep moving up. But I, I'd like to do some just sort of very basic back of the envelope math, if you will. Um, so if you take 800, let's call it 800 million adults globally uh, that are obese, um, currently Nova Nordisk estimates that just under 2% are um, treated with anti-obesity medication. Uh, and if you look at the adjacent kind of diabetes market, the penetration rate of people taking medicine for diabetes um, is about 15%. Uh, and it's not beyond the realm of possibility to assume that the penetration rate at some point will be a lot larger than 15%. So if you take it to sort of 20%, and then if you multiply that by the price, and we all know that the price of Ozempic is about $1,000 a month, uh, obviously that price is, is very high. So there's going to have to be discounts to address a large market. But even if you have the price of it, you know, you're starting to look at what could potentially be a trillion dollar market here. And most analysts are a bit scared to, to forecast something like that, right? And that's why you see these early estimates. And of course, the prices will come down. Not all of these 800 million people globally will be able to pay for it. But the medical benefits as they come through and all of these 200 associated diseases, if we show a benefit in those, well, that's a huge healthcare market and it could effectively become that. So, you know, I'm not sitting here and forecasting that this will become a trillion dollar market by 2030, but I, I, we genuinely believe that estimates out there are going to keep rising for, for this area. So hopefully that answers the, the first part of the question. I think the second part is really interesting as well, which is you know, what will happen in terms of who will dominate this market? Today, we basically have a duopoly between two companies. In fact, ZepBound was only launched in December 23. So effectively, Nova Nordisk had the market to itself. And one of the things that is a big factor that's holding back the size of the market short term is supply. Um, so remember when I talked earlier that the hardest part was figuring out how to get a molecule that would hit GLP-1. And so the only type of molecule that we were able to, to produce that is something called a peptide. Now, peptide is kind of a complex molecule. It consists of lots of different proteins. It's not quite as complex as a monoclonal antibody or um some of the kind of more complicated types of, of drugs that we're seeing today, but it's pretty complicated and it's hard to produce. Just to give you a sense of how hard it is to produce, uh, Eli Lilly commissioned a plant in 2020 for production of its GLP-1 drug, and it's only now coming online. So it took four years to, to build and certify by the FDA. And this difficulty of production is the real factor that's holding back supply right now. Last year, Nova Nordisk had to, had to basically restrict the amount of drug it was selling into the market. It had to restrict new patients starting because it was worried about supplying existing patients. And this is the thing that's holding things back quite strongly short term. And Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly have basically sewn up the market in terms of supply. You saw a very interesting deal that Nova Nordisk did earlier this year by buying a key outsource partner called Catalan. Effectively, the foundation bought Catalan, and then Nova Nordisk bought three plants from them. And this is just uh, a quite an unusual move in the pharmaceutical sector to buy an outsourced supplier. Uh, normally, pharmaceutical companies sell plants to them rather than the other way around. So this is telling you that supply is a big problem. And so a key question will be, how does that get unlocked over time? Obviously, by building out more and more supply and manufacturing. Uh, but I think it's one of the factors that maintains the duopoly. while peptides are the only types of molecules that can drug GLP-1 or any of the other types of hormones that we're going after in terms of um, controlling and getting weight loss effects. Now, there's a holy grail, which is, can we get a small molecule? Imagine the, the white pills, like the aspirins of the world, that can, that can hit GLP-1. If that happens, that will be the catalyst that really unlocks and in this enormous market, because it'll be much easier to produce. Because right now, demand far outstrips the supply available. Um, and that's kind of the situation we're in. And then, of course, there's innovation. And we can talk a lot more about what's coming after GLP-1s, because GLP-1s have a lot of problems associated with them. And we can, you know, delve into that question as well. 
Right, right. So um, I saw that Tema recently published a new paper, and uh, it is uh, the next 10 weight loss drugs life after Ozempic. So this paper highlights the most promising drugs which are currently in development. Please talk about them. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's it's fascinating what's happening. Um, and then for, for those interested, you, know, you can always head to our website and, and read this paper. Uh, and it's really just uh, our kind of way of thinking, okay, how do we conceptualize the next generation of weight loss drugs? And I think it all comes down to what are the problems with GLP-1s? So the first problem I just talked about at length, which is the supply problem. We really can't supply the whole market because of peptides. So are there drugs that are going after this holy grail, the, the kind of white pill, and can we actually make that work? The second thing is tolerability. GLP-1s, it's very well known, are associated with some you know, less than pleasant side effects. Often uh, can be nausea, vomiting, gastrointestinal side effects. And these uh, are tolerable enough, so the drugs are safe to, to use, but um, they can be unpleasant for some patients. And the discontinuation rate is actually quite high. So um, after a year, people on the Govi, you know, if you start on the Govi, only about 30% are on the drug a year later. Uh, whereas for typical other chronic uh, medicines, that number should be nearer to 40 to 50%. And so that tolerability is something, another problem that needs to be solved with GLP-1s. The third problem is called muscle loss. So one of the issues with GLP-1s is you lose the weight. So, you know, we're talking 15%, but you lose both fat and other types of tissue, particularly muscle tissue. And what's quite interesting is the body composition actually improves. So you lose more fat than you lose muscle. But still, losing muscle isn't a great thing, especially if you think about the elderly population where they were already suffering from a decline in muscle mass. So it could be a problem. Uh, and so that's another issue that's being trying to be addressed by the next generation. And the final one is kind of improving on the efficacy. Can we do better than the 15%? And so what we've done is, is kind of created this framework around these four problems, right? Supply, tolerability, efficacy, and muscle loss. And we've tried to group the different drugs that are coming down the pipe into these kind of four areas. So without going into too much detail, I, you know, I recommend reading the full paper, but examples of drugs, say, for example, in the efficacy space is Eli Lilly, who have gone after what is called the triple G drug. And this is called triple G because it hits three different types of uh, hormones, or gut hormones. So GLP-1 is one of them, but there's also GIP and glucagon. And effectively, by hitting all three, they've managed to show in an early trial 24% weight loss, which is an enormous number. Now, with that kind of efficacy, you're probably going to see some sort of safety issues. But it's very interesting that they're able to show those kinds of numbers. And this is a drug that could really live in the very, you know, if you're really, really obese, 15% might not actually be enough to get you to the stage where you're, you're getting into that healthy range. Uh, and this is a drug that could help with that. If you go for the uh, the supply picture, there's a drug that, again, uh, Eli Lilly's partner with Chugai, which is a Japanese pharmaceutical company uh, called, and I'm always really bad at pronouncing it, I think it's called Oligopron. Dr drug names are always kind of one of the harder parts of, <laughs> of pronunciation, but effectively it's Orphogliplon, that's it. And Orphogliplon is a white pill. So if we can show the same types of weight loss and the same types of safety as we've seen with peptide GLP-1s in a pill, that could really unlock the market. So you could see a world where people might go on the injectable peptide GLP-1s early to lose the weight, but then as a maintenance therapy, they go on the white pill, which is a lot better and easier to kind of take uh, over time. In terms of tolerability, there are other targets that are being studied. Uh, the biggest one of these is called amylin, which is another type of uh, incretin hormone. And amylin is much more tolerable. Uh, so it has less effects in terms of the gastrointestinal. And there's a lot of studies being done in terms of looking at combining it with GLP-1 or it as a standalone. And there's a few companies that are focusing on amylin. Zealand Pharma, for example, in Denmark is one of them. But Nova Nordisk itself has got actually two drugs in this area. Uh, one is called amicretin, and the other one is called cagrisema, which is a combination of amylin with a GLP-1. 
So the idea is, can we find another target that produces the weight loss, but is a lot more tolerable to take? So I've covered now supply in terms of white pill, which is the one being done by Eli Lilly and Chigai, I've covered efficacy with the triple G with Eli Lilly. Amelin is, is in terms of tolerability, but muscle loss is, is very interesting where, where, you know, that requires a completely different target. And the idea is, can we combine that with GLP-1 so that you lose weight, but you maybe keep muscle or gain muscle? And of course, uh, you know, the, I guess the gym and the aesthetic industry, that's really the holy grail, right? Like, imagine if you could take a drug and basically gain lean muscle, lean mass, right? You're gaining muscle. A couple of different companies that are working on it. Regeneron would be one I would pull out that they are very focused and they have a, a heritage looking at particular targets in this. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a crazy thing to study, right? You, you're effectively studying how to gain muscle. So, so that gives you hopefully a flavor of the types of approaches and a framework to kind of think about them, which is how we're thinking about them here at Tema. Yeah, definitely very exciting developments. So you talked about side effects, safety issues, tolerability of these GLP-1 drugs. I wanted to discuss a little bit the recent uh, political pressures to re reduce prices. And uh, there was a study, a recent study, uh, which found that a month's supply of Ozempic could be made for less than $5. And after that, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, called the price of Ozempic totally absurd and outrageous, and he said that it should be sharply lowered. So do you think that these companies would be forced to lower prices of their drugs, and uh, will they, that affect their profitability? That's a really interesting question. I think it's important to, often with political messages, they can be, well, you know, political, right? Um, I think that study is probably a little bit misguided. And the reason for that is the production of peptides, these, these the GLP ones like Ozempic, is, is really, really complicated. And it requires very advanced plants that have to be authorized by the FDA. So there's a lot of fixed capital expenditure that has to go in place to produce these uh, these drugs. And then the reagents and all of the consumables, if you will, of that production are actually quite a much lower part of the cost base. But you have to build the actual plant, which costs, you know, sometimes in the billions of dollars. And uh, you can imagine these vast tanks that are, have to be sterile and everything has to be in great condition and up to the right manufacturing standards. And um, you know, it needs to be regulated and authorized. And, and it's very, very important to remember the fixed capsule cost that goes in. It's like what's happened often in the telecoms industry, right? Once all the towers and the cables are built and everything's dug, everyone's like, oh, well, you know, it costs nothing to send that extra gigabyte down the pipe. But people forget that the capsule cost that went into it is really, really important part. So I think I just want to make sure that, that that's understandable, that these companies are making big investments in the manufacturing of this. Now, our view in general is that the prices will have to come down for wider access. Um, access is increasing, partly because of what we talked about at the beginning, which is these other, you know, the data being proved out in things like cardiovascular disease. So we've had Medicare uh, effectively say that the Govi is now approved for people with cardiovascular disease for, for Medicare and Medicare plans. Uh, which is a big step. Previously, it wasn't uh, approved at all. And so as access grows, you, of course, will see pressure on prices. And I think it's important that basically Nova and Lilly can lower the prices to get more access and more patients. But remember the beginning of our conversation, supply is still a problem. So if you can't actually deliver the drug, what's the use of raising, of cutting the price to get more access right now? Um, that's the biggest issue right now. And to give you a stat on this, which kind of blew my mind, is the first market that of a Govi or a, you know, a Zempic for weight loss was available was Denmark, which is the home market of Novo Nordisk. And in Denmark, the, about 1% of the population are on the Govi and they pay entirely out of pocket. So this is a $12,000 drug. Uh, and, you know, uh, Danes aren't really no noted for their kind of frugal, you know, spending habits. They're basically paying for it out of pocket. So that tells you how much demand there is that. And, and this is kind of unheard of. Normally people don't, especially in a country like Denmark, where you have a, a socialized healthcare system where people are used to, to having all of their drugs paid for, paying out of pocket for a medicine. So I'm just telling you kind of the supply and demand dynamics. So I think we're noticing that Lily will eventually lower prices for access, but I think it's going to take some time. 
political pressure is important, but you know we're just getting approval in government programs. So they don't have a lot of levers to pull in terms of pushing that onto companies, uh, onto the companies. Now, let's talk about your ETF. The ticker symbol is HRTS. Uh, please tell us about the investment approach and what it currently holds. Yeah, absolutely. So HRTS, which is the obesity and cardiometabolic ETF, is kind of the first in the market and the only obesity and weight loss drug focused ETF. It's actively managed, which I think is very, very important in this market because uh, biotechnology as a space and life sciences and healthcare, they're notoriously prone to downside risks. You know, can you imagine what it takes to develop a drug? You have to get the biology right, the science right, the uh, clinical right, the commercial right, the regulatory right, and you have to fund all of that because before you see any revenues, it's very, very important to have an approach where you basically have an expert navigating the risks associated with it. Not all of these drugs are going to succeed. And to do that, we have a fund manager whose name is David Song. He's a veteran of the market. He spent 25 years in industry and investing, uh, running a, a healthcare fund. Uh, so he knows the space in and out. Uh, he's an expert focused on, on the, the obesity and metabolic space. And HRTS's investment approach is pretty simple. Find innovation within the space that we can back where there are asymmetric risk reward opportunities. That's basically what we're doing. And we do that with a very careful risk managed approach. As I said, because of these downside risks, you need to be very cognizant of the risks involved in investing here. Um, in terms of the holdings, uh, obviously you'll find the duopoly, uh, as I've sort of highlighted hopefully, is that we're, we're still believers that the duopoly will maintain. And also that these companies, like the drug examples I gave in terms of Eli Lilly and Nova Nordis, they're not sitting still, right? They're developing the next generation to evergreen their franchises. There are other barriers to entry that are not worth mentioning, but we think the duopoly has definitely still got legs. And as the market gets more and more cognizant of how big this the potential is, we think the shares are more to go. Similarly, there's other investments, you know, in the, in the obesity space. Companies like Viking Therapeutics, um, which is and Zealand, are holdings within the fund. So we believe both of those have really exciting pipelines. Uh, Viking just delivered a set of data since the start of the year. Um, two two different data readouts have been very positive. That give them a very competitive profile in obesity. But HRTS is also a lot more than just the focus on obesity, right? The obesity is the first part, but there's also cardiometabolic. So we have continuous glucose monitoring companies in terms of medical technology businesses. Um, these, I think, are going to be a great complement to the obesity drugs because people who have diabetes still need to monitor their glucose. And there's a really fantastic product cycle happening in these companies as well. And then there's other areas, you know, a big uh, holding is, is a company called Cytokinetics, that's developing a drug for a, a particular type of heart disorder that leads to thickening of the heart muscle that affects a lot of young people, especially well-trained athletes. And it can be devastating. You know, it can lead to sudden cardiac death. And they've just had a fantastic phase three readout. So we're investing across the cardiovascular and cardiometabolic space, but our big focus is obviously obesity as well, which is where a lot of the excitement is. So let's move from obesity to cancer now. And you offer an oncology ETF, the ticker symbol is CANC. So I read a recent report in the Wall Street Journal, which uh, revealed a very concerning trend that cancer rates are rising and for several common types of cancers, uh, including breast cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma. And the report also highlighted that more and more younger people are getting cancer, which was very concerning. However, the encouraging trend is that we are getting better at treating cancer. And that is why cancer deaths in the US have been dropping. And uh, because this is another big market, so big pharma has been spending billions of dollars to develop, to develop these drugs or to acquire innovative biotech companies which are working on discovering new cures. So please tell us about the investment case for this ETF and its approach. Yeah, so so this uh, CNC is part of our um, healthcare suite. Uh, we've got three funds. Uh, one of them was HRTS. The other one is CNC, and CNC is focused on on oncology. Uh, and oncology, unfortunately, still remains, as you've highlighted, uh, the second leading cause of death uh, globally, and it's a real problem. And 
it's very interesting what you say about younger people and the rising rates uh, of cancer incidents. It's got scientists baffled. We don't really know why it's happening. And unfortunately, you know, it's, it's afflicted important personalities like the Princess of Wales and, uh, sorry, the, the, the Duchess of Cambridge, isn't it? Uh, and I, I think it's, it's, it's worrying because normally cancer historically has been associated as a disease of aging. Uh, and this is a big driver of, um, of kind of cancer markets, if you will, because populations are aging and uh, the UN projects quite a large increase in, in number of people over the age of 60 um, by 2050. Uh, that population is almost going to double. And that unfortunately is going to bring kind of a lot more cancer cases. Um, so, so maybe just to address the kind of what we're doing, we're, we're again, the idea is to invest in innovation, not kind of me too companies or, or uh, things that have been approaches that have been done before. And we're really looking for that breakout innovation uh, where we can find interesting risk reward opportunities in different companies that are bringing that innovation to market. It's actually a balanced portfolio, which I think is important to say, you know, we're not just investing in kind of the pre-revenue biotechnology businesses. Uh, we've got established biopharma companies in there. Uh, we think they're exciting. They're developing a lot of great treatments for oncology as well. Then we have the pre-revenue, what we call emerging biotechs that are doing the exciting clinical work. And finally, we have the kind of the growth companies. Maybe I'll highlight a little bit about the growthy companies. And one of the most exciting areas that is a, a big bet in the fund is, is cancer diagnostics. And this is addressing the challenge, especially in younger patients. So it's companies like Exact Science and Garden Health and 10X Genomics. These were high-flying stocks, you know, a couple of years ago uh, in, the, in kind of the boom years and have really fallen back. But the, they continue to collect data to develop tests. And, you know, we have very, very good colorectal cancer tests, which is one of the areas of cancer incidence that's rising among young people. Their holy grail is ideas that can we develop what is called a liquid biopsy, as in can we detect cancer in a blood test? And that's what these companies are dedicated to trying to find out. And that will actually really help the younger population because that can detect cancer early and detect it um, ideally multiple different types of cancer in blood tests. Cancer detection early really saves lives. Uh, a cancer that's detected early is an enormous improvement in survival rates because of what you mentioned earlier, which is the improvements in treatments. And so what we're focused on is kind of within that growth bucket is these types of businesses. It's innovation, it's evaluation opportunity because you know, all of these stocks have been really beaten up and this kind of continual building out of science. And the portfolio, again, is managed by David Song. Uh, he's got a lot of experience in, in the space as well, and he's focused on really understanding the science, but also the key areas of oncology where there's a lot of interest from large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so you mentioned acquisition of biotechs, and that's a big feature of this fund. Um, we've you know, so far had a very high success rate in terms of having M&A targets in our fund, so companies that are getting bought from us. Um, and quite encouragingly, is in higher position sizes than you would normally expect in a fund like this. Uh, and what, where are they buying? I mean, they're buying in such interesting areas. I think the first one to highlight is, is, is called ADCs, antibody drug conjugates. And the idea here is, how can we make better chemotherapy? Can we make an antibody, link it to a toxic drug, which is what chemotherapy is, and let it go and seek out and find cancer in the body? The traditional chemotherapy approach, which today is still given to 37% of cancer patients, is just give them the toxic drug. And of course, that has terrible side effects. Can we actually combine the two? And ADC companies, that's what they're focused on. And they're being snapped out of the market, including out of our funds, by large pharmaceutical companies because they see a large market, as I said, 37% of patients still get chemotherapy, and a really a much better, much more precise treatment and this is the kind of thing that we're investing in, um, in terms of innovation and areas that are going to be getting a lot of attraction and interest in this space. So in addition to rise in cancer cases, we have also seen an alarming increase in 
diseases of the central nervous system, which is ranging from Alzheimer's to depression. And again, the encouraging trend is that uh, there is significant innovation in these areas as well, whether it's the treatment for Alzheimer's or tools for early diagnosis. And your third ETF in the healthcare ETF suite is the mental ETF, MNTL. Please tell us about this ETF. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think it's, it's it's interesting, right? If you think about how we've sort of thought about addressing the healthcare in terms of the ETFs that we've launched, we really focused on what are the big unmet major medical challenges for the next several decades? What are the biggest markets that are growing, but also have the highest disease burden? And so we've gone for, you know, obesity, as I talked about the 220 different diseases, a billion people uh, living with obesity, oncology, the second leading cause of death and affecting lots and lots of people and increasing because of the aging population and mental health, which is kind of the the silent sort of not discussed as widely uh, area. But a recent study uh, published in Lancet as well estimated that 43% of the world's population suffer from some sort of disorder of the central nervous system, you know, whether it's Alzheimer's or depression or schizophrenia or any of these things. And I mean, I, I was blown away when I read that number. And what's even more worrying is, is the kind of disease burden, which is measured in healthcare in terms of quality days, you know, DALIs they're called. Uh, and the idea is that these diseases are, are affecting lots of people, but they're also making life really difficult for these people. And so the idea behind mental, uh, between, I guess, our whole healthcare suite is like, let's address these areas and mental is a real important part of them. That And again, it's really important to have an active approach because unfortunately, in many ways, mental health and neuroscience is kind of the final frontier of medicine, which also means that it's full of problems and difficulties in development. It's really hard to measure endpoints. It's really hard to figure out what's going on in the circuitry of the brain. As we all know, the brain is the most complicated organ, and I'm not even starting on the whole central nervous system. It's really, really complicated. Uh, if you've ever talked to a neuroscientist, you'll understand, you know, they used to say you're as smart as a rocket scientist. I think it's as smart as a neuroscientist. It's probably the next thing, or if it's not, it's not taken over. Um, and so w- what's going on is, It's really hard and we're trying and lots of approaches have failed. And there's a whole new burst of innovation trying to address these things. I think the first thing is is Alzheimer's disease. There have been so many tried and failed approaches to understand what's going on in Alzheimer's. Uh, A disease together with dementia, which is associated with it, affects 55 million people. It's, It's just really difficult to treat and all we've had to date is just effectively drugs that treat some of the symptoms but we've never had a true disease modifying agent until the approval of the drug from biogen but obviously that had problems and this year hopefully with very good data in hand Eli Lilly will be able to um, launch once approved a drug in Alzheimer's the first real kind of disease modifying agent it was a real watershed moment for the space. And this is the kind of innovation we're investing. Lily is also part of the fund. Um, and, and the idea is, is to look at lots of this innovation and navigate that kind of minefield as the final frontier of medicine and invest in it um, to give investors exposure to the space that's effectively really large, but quite difficult to get exactly the exposure that you want without you know, losing a lot of money. So these are all very interesting ETFs and we'll be watching these areas very, very closely because there obviously would be a lot of innovation in these areas. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about another ETF, another Tema ETF, which I found quite interesting. It is your reshoring ETF. And it is because so many American companies are now focusing on nearshoring, friendshoring and reshoring. And they want to make their supply chains safer and more reliable. And this shift was particularly pronounced because all these companies had to navigate a lot of challenges uh, driven by global supply chain challenges, uh, including disruptions caused by the pandemic. Then recent conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East and 
rising US-China trade tensions, they have further accelerated this trend. So please talk a little bit about the CDF. Yes, of course. Um, so we're, we're, we're switching to a completely different um, part of our, our, our suite of, of, of investments. And, and what we're trying to do here is it's really a kind of a hedge against all of the problems in the world. That's the best way to, to position sure. Um, unfortunately, the world is not getting any any better in the sense of the interconnectedness. We've, we've pro probably reached, probably a couple of years ago now, peak globalization. And there are definitely forces at play that are moving the opposite direction. And the, the pandemic exasperated this, but we've got weaknesses in supply chains. I mean, even right now, as we sit, uh, ships can't uh, sail through the Suez Canal. There's a drought in the Panama Canal, so you can't actually, you have to often unload cargoes and cargo ships, you know, to reduce flow through the Panama Canal. And of course, not to mention the Baltimore Bridge disaster. You know, that port is the ninth most important port in the United States. It, it, it's responsible for 3% of imports of everything from cars, but also gypsum, types of steel, etc. And so if you're a company in this world, you're probably thinking, well, things aren't getting better. And this idea that offshoring was, was low cost is actually no longer true. Uh, these countries have industrialized and their wages have risen. If you look at in the 1990s, manufacturing in China was 40 times cheaper than it is in the U U.S., or than it was in the U.S. Today, that's, it's only about three times cheaper. And so once you layer on top of that all of the risks, you actually the, the calculus in the boardrooms looks very different. And, and in a way, what we're doing here is we're sort of thinking, okay, what are the companies that are reshoring manufacturing back to the U.S. and basically gaining an advantage versus their peers on that front? And can we invest in those? What are the companies that are making reshoring happen in, in the sense that they're the ones that are facilitating reshoring? Um, so think of the infrastructure companies, uh, the construction materials that are helping to build all of these new factories, inspection, testing, all of these things that are associated, electrical equipment. Um, and then think of the beneficiaries. What are the companies that are going to win? You know, the transport and railroad companies would be the obvious of just more productive capacity in the U.S. And, and the one thing that maybe people aren't really aware of that's happening behind the scenes is there's been an explosion in manufacturing construction in the U.S. We're, we're basically having a boom in building new factories. Um, you know, the, 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 the headline from Wall Street Journal is, you know, America's back in the factory business. And it's, it's a lot of future-proofed types manufacturing. So, you know, electric batteries, semiconductors, but also lots of very classic type of manufacturing as well. We're building that out and it's being helped along by government programs. And I know we have an election this year, but it's, it's really got bipartisan support because I guess at the end of the day, building factories, it really helps everyone, doesn't it? And so the idea of this fund is to take advantage of this trend. And it's a really powerful long-term mega trend, if you will. And we want to invest against it. And we want to kind of pick the, the reshoring companies, the facilitators, and the beneficiaries as well. And that's what we're doing with an actively managed approach. You're right. Bringing manufacturing back to America is one of the very few areas that the two parties agree on. <laughs> Excellent stuff, Yuri. We'll have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Really enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely. And thanks very much for having me on. That was Yuri Kordiamirian of Tema ETFs. Let's quickly recap the tickers that we discussed. The weight loss ETF is HRTS. The fund focused on cancer is CANC. The one focused on mental health is MNTL, all easy to remember symbols. And the one focused on reshoring is RSHO. Now, these are all very unique ETFs, uh, but uh, we know that the ETF industry never misses any craze. Uh, so Amplify and Roundhill have already filed for weight loss ETFs. So we could see some more competition in this space. For cancer, there is another ETF. It is by range. The range cancer therapeutics ETF, the ticker symbol is CNCR. Thanks for listening. 
If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And also make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.